Good morning. My name is David from 52 Churches in 52 Weeks. Several months ago, with all the intentional church hopping content on this channel, the number one request that I was getting left and right was to visit a temple open house associated with the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, especially in Utah. Now, if you're like me and you come from a different faith background, uh, you may not be aware of some of the intricacies in Latter-day Saint theology. Uh, temples play a significant part. They are houses of the Lord that stand almost like beacons of light and hope. Uh, when I was driving through Utah recently at night, the way that these temples were illuminated in the light at night uh, was something to see. So they serve as symbols of faith for here on earth right now, but also as a stepping stone for eternal life for individuals and also for families. So with temples, dedicated church members will make promises with God, they'll experience His Spirit, and also will perform sacred ceremonies called ordinances. Now, you have to be a recommended church member to gain entrance into a temple. However, when a temple is newly built or renovated, the church will open its doors to the general public for a short amount of time to do a tour. So several months ago, I made my first ever temple visit when I drove out to the Bentonville, Arkansas temple. This was very, very unique to me. Uh, I came away quite impressed with the entire atmosphere outside, just with the amount of families that were smiling, that were taking pictures in front of the temple, and just the overall genuine excitement. It was, it was very palpable. So during my tour, I walked in with about 50 people and kind of perused around the temple. It was more of a beginner's introduction. Uh, the significance of the various rooms eluded me. And like everyone there with the temple, they were fantastic with the staff. Uh, but me being an introvert, I shy away from any kind of special treatment. And so a lot of this, like I needed further education on. And from that video, it had quite the reaction on YouTube to the point where like the number one wish, the number one desire was if I had gotten a personal tour guide to enhance my knowledge and ask questions to. And that feedback resonated and I wanted to, to do a second tour visit, especially in Utah. So fast forward to last month, through a random series of events, I found myself flying out to Utah, breathe in some fresh mountain air, do a few different church services, and also got the rare opportunity to visit two temples with open houses in Utah. One in Orem with a modern day temple, and the second one in St. George, which was a pioneer era temple that I'll have a future video on. So make sure to like and subscribe to stay tuned for that. But with this video for the Orem temple, um, I was so impressed with my tour guides. Um, they just gave me so much information, education, and just enhanced my understanding of this and provided a lot more context. And I found a lot of finer appreciation for some of the details uh, throughout the temple. So in this video, I'll share some takeaways with my Orem, Utah temple visit. Due to the sacred nature of temples, you are not allowed to take any photos or videos inside. The church will provide some footage to media outlets, so I'm gonna use that. But here's a little montage. I'll be back in a moment.
If I can just be real, with all the Latter-day Saint visits I've made on this channel, my Protestant brain is processing so much. Like, I show this in one of my other LDS visits, but it's like, I, I write down a couple ideas for what I want to talk about, and like, at a certain point, it's just like, I can't get enough of what I'm trying to convey. So after this visit, it, and as I've sat on this and pondered and thought about it, like it feels for this visit, my brain is like, like I'm in this giant fruit orchard. And, and you'll see why as I expand on my thoughts with this, but it's like in this giant fruit orchard, it's like I just have like a small little bucket that I can pick off all these fruits, all these thoughts with, and it, it's not big enough. So with this video, I'm gonna try to do my best to convey like what's happening in my head. Because again, as a Protestant, this is all very novel to me. Um, you know, I'm comparing with my own um, belief set that I've grown up with, but at the same time, I see a lot of beauty in this. And with this particular visit, there isn't something that you can get from like a theological standpoint. It's much more, um, much more primitive to an extent, but it's also a lot of beauty from what that stems from. And I think if there's any, if I could simplify things to just one word, just cut off everything else, that one word is growth. Growth. So I'll try to do my best to, to ex express what I thought about this temple visit. But first, I want to say thank you very much to my two tour guides that helped me along for this visit, uh, Mark and Monica. Uh, they were fantastic. And again, like as an introvert, I shy away from any kind of special treatment. But th with what they were able to do just to, with the knowledge, with the time, with the patience, and just the genuine excitement for everything that they were telling me about and showing me inside the temple um, was very, very humbling to me. And I just so really appreciate it. And both of them presented it in kind of a different way. But for me at the end, it kind of like their different insights and how that their different angles for showing me and educating me about this temple, it actually kind of merged together for me and in this kind of beautiful way, because Mark was showing me the beauty of what the temple represents. And Monica was showing me the beauty of some of the finer details with the temple itself. During my tour, uh, one thing that Mark set as a foundation early on, uh, it was from a discussion from Elder Bednar. And uh, Elder Bednar, if you're not aware, uh, he is an apostle, uh, a member of the Quorum of Twelve Apostles. So he was explaining um, to a group with an audience about, you know, you see the beauty of the temple, but don't let that get lost with the purpose of it being a connection to God with the covenants, with the covenants and the ordinances. And the way that he, and he borrowed a talk from President Boyd K. Packer. So I had to research this after, um, after Mark had, had mentioned this. But with President Boyd K. Packer, uh, he gave a talk in April 2000 at, I, I guess it was General Conference. And they had the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, they had just opened up this beautiful new conference center. Everyone was just so excited about these new facilities and just how new everything was and how immaculate things were. Well, he kind of brought everything down a little bit with his talk. And he mentioned about the parable of uh, a merchant and the pearl. So this merchant, he was searching the world for some of the most beautiful pearls, and he came across the perfect pearl. But because it was perfect, he wanted to make sure that it was well taken care of. So he found uh, an amazing craftsman who made this beautiful box and lined it with blue velvet. And he put the pearl in the box, but much to the merchant's disappointment, the people that went to see it, they were more amazed by the box than the actual, the beauty of the pearl inside of it. So when it came to these temples, uh, like don't worry so much about the beauty, the lovely temple,
but it's about the essence. It's about that connection with God, with that connection with Christ. Monica helped me to appreciate some of the finer details inside the temple, especially with the history of Orem. So the area was founded by Norwegian immigrants, and with the plot of land that the church purchased in 2004, uh, they were from church members who specialized in farming fruit orchards, especially cherry trees and cherry blossoms. With the creation of this temple, they made sure to incorporate uh, cherry trees all throughout the different areas of the temple. And what I've learned now with several temples is there is always like a, a unique personalized theme based off the town or area that they try to incorporate into each temple. So here it was cherry trees. So throughout the temple, there's a ton of different type of cherry finishes with the wood. And then they would, and especially with the stained glass windows. So when we first walked in, um, like one of the first things that you notice is this just gigantic baptismal font where you have the 12 strong oxen uh, holding it up from below. And uh, you would see the, the stained glass window. And the stained glass window, it had this, uh, it was very reminiscent of the nearby Utah Lake. And as we walked up the three stories of this temple, the stained glass window would continually change a little bit more because on the second level uh, was a cherry tree. And then when we got to the very top on the third level, that cherry tree was had blossoms now. And uh, it was just so interesting to learn about the stained glass window because apparently it was created by a talented artist named Tom Holdman. Uh, he's so gifted, uh, he actually was given artistic liberty for the stained glass windows at three different temples, Paris, Rome, and Orem, Utah. And I tell you, uh, one thing that, that was pointed out to me was a dragonfly uh, on, the, on the very lower level with the baptismal font. Because I was told that with this dragonfly, the way that the sun hits it, it will change colors. It's very unique than anything else for the stained glass windows. Both perspectives, um, it, it kind of merged as I've been uh, thinking and contemplating after the visit. And like I've talked in other videos about the fruits and obviously that stemmed from, from comments like yourself, especially with Latter-day Saints, by their fruits, you will know them. And it, like I've been thinking much more about the tree of life, you know, especially in Genesis, Adam and Eve, they're in the garden of Eden and they partake in the wrong fruit. And you see what happens after that. With the Book of Mormon, with First Nephi, with Lehi's dream uh, being introduced to this, it, it's, it's an interesting thing to look at from my Protestant brain because it introduces the idea of what happens if you pick the right fruit and what results from that. I mentioned in uh, my last temple visit uh, about my learning that my great-grandfather was a Latter-day Saint. And that's all I had. I didn't really know anything else. And since that video, um, you know, through a random series of events, uh, I learned that he died in 1964. But I didn't know, you know, was he always a Latter-day Saint? Was he a convert? Like, what was the story? And I, I recently learned that he actually was baptized in 1960, four years before his death. So, okay, he, he's a convert. Before that, I had never cared about ancestry. I never knew anything about family trees or anything like that. And afterwards with this temple visit, and I, and I see so many more themes of temples, especially stemming from trees. For this instance, cherry trees. Another one, apple trees. I've seen other temple themes where it incorporated local flowers into it. It's all about growth. And it really started to kind of hit me a little bit because like, where do we get the term family tree from, you know? And the more that I think about, um, you know, those Norwegian immigrants who first settled in Orem, like you don't really, you don't really talk about this in faith discussions or theology talks, just the importance of how agriculture and how planting seeds for where that, for where you're going, where you're immigrating to, and how that is this beauty in the landscape of a place that you're going for the very first time that you're settling.
there's this beautiful combination between how man and God works together. After they partake in the fruit, like that, that relationship is, is severed. And, but at the same point, there's this, there's a spiritual component working when it comes to working the land. And in today's day and age where, you know, we, we just need to go to the grocery store. We really don't appreciate the time and effort that is required to create fruit, to create wheat, to create agriculture, to create food from the ground. But when you think about it, the way that, that man has to plant the seeds in the ground, get his hands in the dirt, and then you need to rely on God. You need to rely on father time. You need to rely on mother nature to, to rain down, to give the proper sunlight. And, you know, it, it's, it's almost like a matter of faith for whoever, you know, plants seeds in a ground that you don't know if it's going to be fertile or not. But give it enough time, you're going to start to see things rise up. You're going to see things blossom. I think with this visit, especially with the cherry tree theme that I was seeing, it was a different type of, and again, I'm still working through this. I'm still processing through this to kind of see that relationship between man and God. With the various rooms that we walk through, the, my Protestant brain, like the one Bible passage that was stuck in my head was John 14 too. Uh, my father's house has many rooms. I'm going there to prepare a place for you. I'm seeing all these different rooms and just understanding and trying to get more of an understanding of the context and the importance of each one. So obviously you went through the baptistry where you see the 12 oxen underneath the, this baptismal font where you perform baptisms for the dead. Uh, we also went through the instruction room and then we also went into the bridal room. And I, again, this is where my ignorance comes in. Um, I didn't know that the brides uh, actually do wear white wedding dresses for their ceilings and their weddings that day. I thought just everyone wore the same type of white um, attire. So this was new to me. And I, I was kind of like, wow, I, I guess wrong on that from whatever I had heard before. Inside the bridal room was quite unique because it just was so feminine with all the different type of paintings. And it was much more, you know, geared for, you know, that relationship with Heavenly Father and then also being given in marriage. So that was different to me. Um, we also went through uh, various sealing rooms. So obviously that's where families are sealed together. And then the one room that really, um, that I didn't really understand much context to in my prior temple open house visit was a celestial room. So Monica had pointed out to me, like on the outside, like they had like a bronze, um, bronze kind of siding with the door, with the doorknob and the handle, but inside it changed to gold. And with a celestial room, it's supposed to be kind of the closest representation that you can have, having peace, having quiet, having tranquility to really meditate and have that connection with Heavenly Father, with Jesus Christ, with the Spirit, and to have that just resonate and be a part of you as you continue on. So again, this is what, what's very unique to me because I, I was kind of learning a little bit something about the, the learning pyramid. So typically, you know, if you listen to something, like you'll retain 5% of that. If you read something, ah, maybe you'll retain maybe 10% of that. If you read and listen, maybe you'll re maybe you'll retain about twenty percent of that. But this, with with the temples and the ordinances and the covenants, and just the demonstrations of it, because I, I'm learning about this le this learning pyramid. If you demonstrate things, that goes even higher for your retention of owning something, owning some knowledge, and then if you're teaching it, or if you're performing something it goes through the roof as compared to just reading or listening to something. And again, as a Protestant, like I'm just so used to listening, sermons, and, and reading the Bible. 
as I contemplate, as I see this, and I just kind of wrestle with what I know, and then just kind of seeing some of the scientific findings on this type of stuff, it, it's it's interesting to see. And I can understand just how how much how faith and how church is impacted by that and what I'm taking away from this visit. Thanks for watching this video on the Orem, Utah Temple. Uh, special thanks to Mark and Monica for serving as my tour guides. Really appreciate your time and patience as you showed me around. For a future video, we're going to be doing the St. George Temple. Uh, this is a historic pioneer era temple that was dedicated in 1877. So you'll want to stay tuned for that one. So make sure to like and subscribe to stay tuned for that. But until next time, hope you have a good one.